So welcome, 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 our beloved, brilliant colleague, Mina, my brother. I so appreciate your consistent leadership and solidarity. And as always at Setsi, we, we begin by acknowledging, giving thanks to our creator. We acknowledge all the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So can you please introduce yourselves to our listeners and viewers and share a bit about your remarkable work? Thanks so much, Victor. I really appreciate you and I appreciate all the work that you do too. Um, very humble to be here. My name is Mina Demian. I am in startup advisor is my full-time job. And I'm a startup advisor with this really fantastic organization called Platform Calgary in the heart of downtown Calgary. And we call it the Innovation Center. And essentially it's the front door for innovation. We're a nonprofit. So it's an absolutely incredible time for folks who have an innovative spirit and want to build. They can build it right there at Platform Calgary. It's a pretty remarkable place. I get to work with around 300 startups per year, or we get to touch around 1400 per year. So I get to see the whole gamut of tech enabled companies all around Calgary. And it's just a very vibrant growing scene and uh, couldn't be happier to be here with you today. So thank you so much. And I also want to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 7 land here at Calgary and uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Métis Nations within District uh, 6, as well as uh, everyone who makes their the, as a first uh, first generation settler, I'm just very glad to be here and very, very fortunate. So thanks, Victor. Thank you so much. I always appreciate your work and the tenacity that you bring to your work. 300 startups a year. It's incredible. That's incredible. Um, and the thought leadership and practitionership that you bring to the table is also remarkable. So my next question, what's inspiring you right now in your work? What has you curious or what's keeping you up at night? I get to work with startups every single day. Like I said, the numbers are staggering. You're right. And so every day it's something brand new. Where I get really excited is when I see folks who are addressing social issues. So my specializations in social enterprise, I decided to go that route in my MBA, specializing in social enterprise, because before I decided to do an MBA, I worked for 15 years in the nonprofit sector. And I was doing fundraising for education institutions, community health clinics, immigrant serving agencies. And what I noticed from my 15 years of working in the nonprofit sector, I was like, there's got to be a freaking better way. At the end of it, you get frustrated as a fundraiser and burnt out because you're like, this is, it's a bit of a shell game. I'm, I hope I'm not insulting anybody, but you're like, this is just crazy. And I was like, okay, so if this whole social enterprise thing works out where you can create social products as well as profit, does that actually solve a lot of those issues? And I wanted to prove that out by experience. And so that's why I pivoted my career, did an MBA. And so I'm really, really fortunate to be working with such incredible startups every single year. And here we are today. And now I can look back at the past year and a half that I've been with Platform Calgary. And I see people addressing things like immigration issues, financial issues amongst newcomers so that they can gain access to credit. You can see people making massive waves in freaking such important ways. So hunger in the city, you know, we have so many incredible organizations that are nonprofits, charitable organizations that try to provide food, simple, basic needs. And then all of a sudden now I'm working with startups that are actually addressing these needs in more efficient, more effective ways. And so I love to have these conversations. That's what's really getting me excited is to ensure that I'm still continuing on helping with that social causes while at the same time now with my startup advisor hat, trying to ensure that there's a connection between some of the nonprofits as well as the startups. So that's what gets me really excited. That's incredible. It gets me excited. Every time we talk offline, you share some of the startup ideas with me. I'm just like, that's brilliant. Like, so yeah, so, so definitely, um, I, I can only imagine. Thank you so much for your candy and your leadership. So my next question, what challenges and barriers do you face in your work? And what are some of the ways you and your colleagues are working towards overcoming these challenges and barriers? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to just lay it out for a perspective. Um, as Alberta is really well known for one thing, uh, economically, it's oil and gas. And so, you know, you kudos to the politicians. You know, this is rare for me to say this, but kudos to the politicians to say that, listen, this is not going to last forever. we got to shift our focus from oil and gas to something else. And so they doubled down and they all said, hey, we got to go in on technology and make sure that we've got a diversified economy. So kudos to them for kind of initiating that uh, 
that conversation. And from there, now we have an opportunity to address a lot of issues in our communities because now we're really focused in on technology and how to leverage technology to address some of those social issues. And our mandate as Platform Calgary is to address the very early stage startups because that's the gap is that you might have a brilliant idea, but heck are you supposed to do with that idea? That idea sticks in your brain and you're like, okay, what do I do next? So my job is to actually say that, okay, so here are the steps that you can take. You can validate your product market fit. You can actually create your MVP. You can create all sorts of different things. You leverage AI, you can leverage free tools in order to actually build your product. You don't have to be a technical founder. So a lot of my job is coaching and trying to provide both resources and courage for someone to actually try something brand new. Some of the challenges that we face at work is, let's say in an ideal scenario, someone goes from an idea to a minimal viable product, you know, you've got your prototype or you've got your proof of concept. That initial stage right there, there's a little bit of a gap because now they're at a critical point. They're going to need developers. They're going to need finance. They're going to need capital. And so this is a critical point where I have been noticing that, that although we're very much invested, uh, Alberta Innovates, kudos to them. They're the main driver of all of the technology that's happening. So lots of grants that are coming out right now. They're coming out for Alberta startups that are in very early stage. But there's still a gap because when you apply for a grant, well, first of all, you have to know how to apply for a grant, which is really challenging. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, I don't come from economic means where I could go to a friends and family round. So grants are essentially what's going to keep a lot of these folks alive. So they go to your grants, you apply for those grants. So one of the barriers that I would notice is that you're going to have to know how to write these grants. The second barrier, of course, is that very early stage seed capital is extremely hard to get to. It's just the same as in San Francisco, I've heard, as it is in Calgary. It's probably a little bit worse. And so, you know, in Calgary, we're still a bit of a growing ecosystem. So we're not as Vancouver or Toronto, who has a very thriving ecosystem, same thing with Montreal, we're kind of still developing that ecosystem. What's really, um, you know, the so, so those are the challenges is actually the access to capital. But the opportunity here is that the ecosystem is absolutely thriving. I can't tell you how many times, Victor, that I introduce you to this person and this person is like, absolutely, uh, of course, let's chat. And so a lot of underrepresented folks are now starting to realize, oh, people are opening doors for me. So that's the you know, best put forward that we can put forward in Calgary and the competitive advantage is that we're not shy about providing opportunities for others and opening up the doors and providing them with many resources and knowledge that I can give them so that they can thrive and succeed and everyone wins. That was a long-winded answer, but that's what challenges and opportunities that I see. No, not, not at all long-winded. I appreciate the context um, because it's important. So this is why we're having these conversations to, to amplify the remarkable work of leaders like yourself. So my next question, how do you feel about the future of social innovation or even tech in Canada? Are you optimistic? Are you hopeful? Are you pessimistic? Do you have any issues around the promise and perils of artificial intelligence or AGI? Mm -hmm. Very, very much uh, an optimist in that regard technology in general. So I'm going to drop some names here because I think they need the exposure, not they don't need the exposure, but rather like I love to brag about some of these uh, startups because I think it will give hopefully if someone's listening or watching this a little bit of a taste of what we do. One of the organizations that I'm really excited about that's making some real inroads in communities called Wovio. It's a fintech and uh, the, yeah, you know, the, the uh, brilliant founder Jonah and his team, they're just doing such incredible work. But what it is, it's revolving savings accounts so that essentially, uh, you know, underrepresented communities can do what they did way back home. It works. Everyone puts in a hundred bucks, 12 months later, you get 1200 bucks in order to actually have a big purchase, whether it might be bulk opportunity for to purchase something for uh, bulk for your restaurant. So now you're in significant amount of savings. If you're putting a product out to market, it means a lot. For these individuals, whether it's it might be something like a renovation for your house that increases the price of the actual house itself, just simple things. It's very flexible, very low interest rate, and of course, it is way better than the parasitic loans that you can get on in neighborhoods. So I love that organization, Wobio. Uh, I'm very optimistic that it's adopted. I think some of the challenges and you know the key message here for anybody is that we've got to be able to provide more open space for these startups to succeed. So I really hope that anybody who's kind of listening or thinking about 
you know, I'm, I'm looking for a savings account that's alternative to the current models. I really hope that they kind of start to consider startups as a viable option for their procurement, whether it might be cities or it might be uh, individuals. There's a lot of really great alternatives. My hope for right now is for Wovio, uh, another organization that I'm working with right now is Need, uh, K-N-E-A-D. And essentially what it does is uh, it's an Uber for food rescue. So it's so brilliant that someone had to come up with the idea that, you know, this uh, grocery store is going to throw out really great bread every single day in the tons. Well, all it was was just an Uber app saying that, no, we're going to go pick it up and then drop it off at the food shelter, or it might be at the uh, emergency food clinics. All those kind of things are so pivotal to our community, but it really needs buy-in from our community, from nonprofits, from individuals. So that's my one hope is that uh, people start to kind of consider those things in terms of AI, though, I really want to address those key things. I think people are completely misguided about what AI is. It's not the scary thing that's going to take us out and, you know, uh, turn into World War III. Essentially, what we have right now is an opportunity to leverage AI. I was fortunate enough to work with the United Nations uh, UNESCO two summers ago, and we had a forum of all these underrepresented individuals, BIPOC communities, to come together and say that, how the heck are we going to be, wh where's our voice in what Mark Zuckerberg is building with Meta or what um, uh, Elon Musk is building with uh, Neuralink? The only way to actually have your voice heard is to get involved, participate, and actually own some of it. Uh, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised once you actually start to enter into these communities, into the tech sphere. Uh, um, it's not as intimidating as you might think, and it also allows you to actually participate in those areas. Uh, the ultimate conclusion for my work with UNESCO was that you need to have participatory opportunities for these individuals. Um, I think for our communities, especially the BIPOC communities, we're uh, always afraid because, you know, we come from areas where we don't trust our governments. We don't trust our, you know, uh, corporate leaders. But here, I think now is your opportunity to actually say, that I'm going to be the corporate leader. I'm going to be the person that's going to be responsible. So that's my hope. And I love doing what I'm doing because then I get to move a little bit of whatever influence that I have in order to make sure that people get ahead and continue to build their dreams. So that's uh, that's my answer for that one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mina. I really appreciate that. So my second last question, what is your ultimate goal and what does success look like and feel like to you and your colleagues? Yeah, I was just having this conversation yesterday about where I would really love to see is picture this. You've got these incredible nonprofit charitable organizations across Canada, and they're doing wonderful work every single day, and they're working their butts off, nine to nine, every single day. And I know whether you're a you know, low-line social worker or if you are you know the CEO, your brain does not shut off because you really care about your communities. My hope is that there is a bridge between leveraging technology and, and like I mean leveraging in a very judicial way. When you turn that lever of technology, you're saving time, you're increasing your impact, you're creating opportunities that had never existed before. The nonprofit sector I find are still siloed and still have this notion that they're gonna do it their way while the startups are just hustling, they're going quickly, they're moving really fast and they need the nonprofits because they're gonna be able to have a communication where they're saying, so the nonprofits are gonna help the startups understand what it's like to actually go through something like poverty, something like hunger, and these startups are going to learn a ton, and the startups themselves are going to be able to provide their technology out to nonprofits. So that's my hope for the future is that we can actually bridge those gaps. Social impact is absolutely the critical component, and that's why I love Setsi. I've been a big fan of what you're doing for so long is because of that reason. It's because you're, you're, you're bridging that gap. So anything that I can do to actually support what you're doing, I'm happy to do. So that's my hope as well. You're doing it just by doing what you do every day in and out for those remarkable startups, my friend. You're a leader and a, and a visionary from my perspective, so I appreciate you. So my last question, do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action for our listeners and our viewers? Take risks. I think we've been in a situation where, you know, Canada's a really wonderful place of very polite people that are very much, you know, neighborly everywhere. 
I think what we need to do is take more risks to actually enhance what we're already doing, which is the politeness, which is the neighborliness, which is opening doors for people. Taking risks is going to allow us to be a little bit more competitive in the marketplace. And, and I mean, like marketplace, I know I'm talking with my startup advisor hat, but even in the nonprofit sector, imagine if we were to take more risks in order to address more issues with hunger and uh, racism and all those kind of things. There needs to be a little bit more risk taking within our space. And I think, uh, I, I don't know, I'm pretty plugged into you know, future of good and all the great things that they've been able to do. I think I can see things starting to move now where funders are saying, hey, we're not going to be taking the safe bet anymore. We're going to be taking a bet on the bold leadership, such as SETSI, such as other organizations that are doing wonderful work. They're bold. They're getting out there in the community. They're having their voices heard. This is, it needs to be doubled down on. That's what's really going to move our community forward. And we're going to be leaders in the future. So that's my call to action. Take risks. Incredible, incredible. Thank you so much for your introspection, your guidance, your wisdom, and your authenticity, as always. I just so appreciate everything you stand for. You represent us well, my friend. I appreciate you, brother. So, as always at Setsi, we close the way we began, by acknowledging giving thanks to our creator, by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, Mina. I so appreciate you. Appreciate you too, man. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.